Blog Talk Radio. Hey guys, want to kill that cable bill? How about getting a Netmaster? You can watch live TV, pay-per-view, premium content like HBO and Stars, all of the sports channels like NBA League Pass, NFL Red Zone, and every movie ever made. Pay for the box once, no monthly fees ever. For more information, contact Dean 13 Media at 609-807-1175. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening, good evening, and welcome to the Voice of the People. It's Monday, April 9th, 2018. We're trying to dodge the snow, get rid of the cold weather, but right now it's hot right here at the Voice of the People. And I'm in the studio with Mark Lee. Mark, tell me what's good your neck and voice, man. No falling. And I'm sitting there going like, hey, why is there snow falling in the month of April? I could not believe that there was snow falling in the month of April. A little snow, a little sleep, but it did not stick. So I was glad to see that. And it's a little bit on the uh, school side. I, you know, it's more like a brisk, maybe like a fall-like day. It's maybe about uh, got into the 60s or something like that earlier today. And I think that's what it's supposed to be for the next day or two. But, uh, you know, that's not too bad. But uh, we're looking for some 80s. I believe they're calling for those to come around Thursday or uh, Wednesday at the earliest, so we're about to head into some more spring-like weather, but uh, the weather just cannot make up its mind. One minute it wants to feel like winter, the next minute it wants to go back into spring, so it's trying to decide what it wants to do. Kind of like some of our uh, folks in the political office, they can't decide what they want to do, whether they want to have trade wars or not. Yeah, and and, and all of the craziness that's going on with Syria, and you know, they're planning on jumping in the middle of that arena, but I say, can you jump in the middle of the issues that we have going on right here in these United States first? But nobody's listening to not, that, I guess. Not, not only that, but they don't. They want to jump into the middle of issues and do some stupid things. Like I know last week, I think that he made some statement about there had been millions of voters that had uh, committed voter fraud in California. And, you know, if you do the math, that would be like, what, one out of every ten, one out of uh, – some ridiculous amount of people that he's claiming were voting wrong in California because, you know, he definitely did not win that state. So I guess he's just trying to claim that they all are crazy and voted against him and it was all a grand conspiracy. But you still won. That's the part I don't understand. Like, should you, and I guess it's just me, but should you care? You know, you're the only person I know that won. And you're like, you know what, hold up. It's fraud over here. They're not doing the thing the right way over there. And it's like, come on, man. Shut up. <laughs> I agree. I agree. But, you know, the weekend was very good for me this weekend. We had some very good entertainment here in Durham on Friday night. Marcus Anderson. Marcus Anderson used to play with Prince and uh, before Prince passed away. And uh, he's played with a lot of other great musicians. And he has some music that he's put out of his own as well. He's living up in the D.C. area, but uh, he came and gave a concert. Not a fully packed house in our uh, home of the Haytai, but it was a good show, and he definitely had the place rocking, and people were dancing in the aisles and doing all of that, so I did talk to nice. him, and he did say that he would be glad to be on our show, so we're going to have to have Marcus call us in the uh, upcoming edition of the uh, Voice of the People, because I was telling him about what we had going on. Just like on Saturday afternoon, I went to go see some friends of mine that had produced their own, well, films. They first they did like a miniseries, so they showed three uh, episodes of the uh, miniseries, which is kind of like a spy novel entry kind of thing that deals with government intrigue and all of that kind of stuff, and definitely is uh, worth checking out called The Wicked Series. And then they have a film that they just did called Blue Crossing, which deals with bad cops and uh just how that can happen in our police force. So uh, definitely uh, I have to give a big shout-out to uh, Jay Darrell White. Um, Nick, I believe his last name is Nick Dalmacy, if I remember correctly, and my good friend, Ayanna Johnson. Those are the three producers of this film. And I know I talked to Ayanna about being on the show. I think I talked to Jay Darrell. So hopefully they will be making an appearance as well because, you know, Ayanna's done a whole lot of great things. She's also done some stuff to her church as a missionary. So she's gone to Africa and done some missionary work. And then she's definitely been in both the acting and the modeling field. She was our uh, one of our um, Kiki Shepherds when we were 
doing the Road to the Apollo, which will be starting again in another month or two, me and Captain Newborn and that crew. So uh, it was good seeing her and seeing that she's doing some real positive things. And like I said, we're looking forward to having her on the show as well. Just got to try to lock her schedule down and try to see when we can get her on. But the film show was in Raleigh at a movie theater called Mission Valley, a regular movie house. And uh, they had a nice crowd, good uh, audience reaction. You know, people were definitely enjoying themselves. And definitely we're giving a lot of shout outs on Facebook and Instagram and other things. So uh, the film is definitely making some noise and now they're just trying to hit the festival circuit and also possibly pick up some uh, distribution type deals because I know they're talking to people, you know, out there in Hollywood and things of that nature. And speaking of the movie industry, I know that you know and I know that Rick uh, Kelly, who we've had on the show before, that he has yes. uh, went up to Charlotte and won an award. Yes, congratulations to Ricky Kelly for winning Best Documentary at the Charlotte Black Film Festival for Black Beach, White Beach. And for those who've been following us for quite some time, he spoke about that documentary, and he was in the process of making it when we spoke with him. But now it's out, it's one for this, and and now hopefully it, it goes further than just there, you know, so... Look out for it. Black Beach, White Beach is the name of it by Mr. Ricky Kelly. And we salute you here at, at the Voice of the People for the uh, marvelous job that you have done with that documentary. So, you know. He Uh-oh. did a great job. That is for sure. I believe we have a guest. I was expecting a guest today. Yeah, we do have a guest tonight. We're going to um, pop the door open and see who's at the door. Let's see. So, um, before we'll call in and join the conversation at 646-668-8393 is the voice of the people with Dean Geronimo and Mark Lee. Who do we have at the door? It's Howard Stevenson. How are you doing, good, Dr. Sir. Stevenson? Good, good. How are you? I'm doing very well. I was actually just thinking about you a little bit yesterday, um, because I was watching, uh, as I was telling Dean, as we were doing some of our earlier bantering, I saw a couple of films, and uh, I went to a convert, like a feature film, or a feature more of the narrative type film, but Durham has this big film festival called the um, Full Frame Film Festival, and usually I try to go to that every year. It's a big documentary film festival. I usually hit six or seven films, if not more, every year, but this year with all we had going on at our cultural arts center, the Haiti Heritage Center, I did not attend as many as I usually do, but I did go to the closing film. And the closing film was a film called, uh, that dealt with the uh, school industry and things of that nature. And I know that that's part of what you talk about as well. So they were showing a film that uh, the filmmaker actually had attended uh, a film, I mean, a school. I believe he grew up in uh, the Midwest area. And so he had. Uh, mm-hmm gone to one of those highly elite um, schools that do very well in those kind of communities. And one of the things he wants to do, even though he's a white filmmaker, he's actually the same filmmaker that did the film uh, Hoop Dreams, but he did a film called America to Me. And what it is is he went around following minority students to see how they were coping as they were going to this particular school that they uh, attend. And like I said, it has a very good reputation as one of those um, – kind of elite schools that has a reputation for, you know, getting their students into top universities and things of that nature. But that's, even though there are students like us that go to that school, Mm -hmm. they don't always seem to do that well. So that's part of what the documentary Mm -hmm. was doing was following them around to see how they were doing and things of that nature. As a matter of fact, Mm -hmm. there's there's going to be a 10 part documentary series. It's It's this stunning Ten-part documentary series for director Steve James offers a profound examination of diversity and equity at Oak Park and River Forest High School in Chicago. With incredible mm. access to the school, home to over 3,000 students, nearly, whom, whom, nearly half of whom identify as people of color, the series takes us inside classrooms, administrative meetings, and even school board discussions to consider how race and resources play a role in students' and educators' ability to succeed. Mm-hmm. Excuse me, but I know that that's part of what your research has been. It says these issues emerge from a variety of remarkably personal stories. A wrestler aiming to lose weight so he can start on the varsity team, a freshman excited to attend his first school dance, or a teacher struggling to break through to a promising student. So uh, that's part of what the whole movie was about. So they were definitely looking at some of these students and finding out how they were 
succeeding as African American students um, in this university. I mean, in this high school that has a reputation for being a uh, top performer in terms of um, standardized testing and also in terms of getting people into top universities and things of that nature. So. I do, I say that to say that I know that that's some of what your research has been about, is to how our students don't always do a great job of uh, teachers seem to always don't always understand people from our perspective and everything. So if you'll just talk a little bit about some of your research, we'll go from there. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, so the the um, we have been doing research for quite a bit of years, over about 20, 25 to 30 looking at how children of color fare in predominantly white schools and predominantly black schools. And we ask questions around race and racial politics. You know, how do young people navigate conflicts um, being uh, only a few folks in the school percentage wise of color and those who actually are trying to make sense of racism in the society and how that also influences their schooling experience. So, um, you know, currently we are looking at the power of racial socialization or racial talking to children about how to navigate racial conflict and that my research has demonstrated or is in the process of demonstrating that the more kids get feedback, skill sets, uh, knowledge about how to understand racial environments and racial politics, they can do a better job of of not internalizing negative feelings about themselves, having more positive uh, understandings of their community and culture, and also, frankly, can uh, deflect a lot of the hostility as about the, the, the person delivering the hostility instead of that, that is something about their difference that's the problem. So we call that racial socialization, and in the last, I'd say, 20, uh, last you know, ten, five to ten years, we've been really focusing on how, what kind of skills do young people need, and parents as well, teachers as well, police as well, to not overreact or underreact when they're in a racially stressful moment, which for many of our children and our families and our adults, mothers and fathers and uncles, when they're confronted by authority figures who get scared by their difference, it only takes two minutes for them to make a bad decision. So right now we're really focused on how do we help people make better decisions within two minutes, regardless of who they are, when a racial moment is happening. Yeah, because it seems like one of the problems, and you can tell me if this is correct, but it seems like one of the problems that exists is that we don't have enough, particularly African-American male teachers, but just African-American teachers in general. So a lot of times we're having teachers that are of other ethnicities, be that white, be that Asian, be that uh, Latin American or whatever, that are trying to – understand their African-American students but might not have any of that kind of background themselves or they have that background or they have any understanding. It's stereotypical understanding that they're getting from our public media and our media institutions, which we know oftentimes are not, while they may be based on some reality, they're not always grounded in total reality because some of these stereotypes can be blown out of proportion. Yeah. I mean, we know that a lot of times a lot of our youth get um, harassed and um teased a lot because of the styles of clothes that they want to wear. And they may not understand that some of that comes out of the uh, prison system and things of that nature, but it's become like a, a fad or something that's out there or maybe something like Panther that they decide that they want to wear those kind of clothes and some of their teachers may not understand where that's coming from. So I was wondering how some of the things that you've done through your research to help some of the teachers understand ways to cope with these kind of uh, situations. <laughs> um, yes, um, I'm, I'm partly, you know, I think, you know, when you look at um, <clears throat> why this is important, there's a lot of research on, on on when these moments happen, racial microaggressions occur when somebody dismisses youth of color, black youth, male or female. Um, sometimes they might swallow the Kool-Aid or internalize the negativity that others might throw on them. You know, um, the, the the issues in schools and, and, and the quality of relations with teachers suggest that black students do not feel as safe or as close to their teachers. And teacher-student relationships are a big issue 
in achievement, in academic achievement, believing that your teachers 